You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is so great to have you joining us today. And we're going to talk about China, the Uyghurs, and is what's happening there a genocide? And we are speaking today to a writer and a historian, Amy Lutz. She wrote a great article in The Federalist, and uh, she it is titled, The United States Should Give Hong Kongers and Uyghurs a Ticket to Freedom. And this is something that I have thought for a long time, and I don't know why we don't do it. And so I wanted to bring Amy on to discuss it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. So first, can I ask how you got interested in this topic? Absolutely. So um, I actually have a master's degree in history. And for many, many years, I've been interested in the area of Holocaust studies. And so anytime there are contemporary events that I feel relate to the Holocaust, any time genocide, ongoing totalitarianism, that just kind of rings a bell in my head. I think people often hear the words genocide, but can you define what that means? So the word genocide was actually um, defined very specifically by the UN in 1948, actually right after the Holocaust. And there are several different um, categories and elements of genocide. And if you meet a certain number of them, um, then the UN will determine a certain action of genocide. And so those include things like you know, to be honest, the most obvious, the attempted eradication of an entire group of people, an entire religion, an entire race. Um, but it also includes things that we would probably call cultural genocide, an attempt to um, erase culture, erase history of a particular group of people. And so there's different elements, but those are two that are included in the definition. Yeah, I can think of, you know, Rwanda and the Sudan as, as kids, obviously, what's happened in Myanmar and with the Uyghurs recently, but how common is genocide in our day and age? You know, unfortunately, it is more common than um, we would like to admit, most likely. I mean, you know, we said after the Holocaust, we said never again. And unfortunately, we have seen, you know, as you mentioned, with Myanmar and with Rwanda, um, a number of genocides in the 20th century. And so most of the time, you know, this is, I don't have the statistic off the top of my head, but for the remainder of the 20th century following the Holocaust, for most of the years, there was at least one ongoing genocide. So let's talk about the People's Republic of China, uh, the PRC founded in 1949. And you look at what's gone on in China and, um, you know, the president recently said in a town hall that part of their societal norms is just what's happening with the Uyghurs. And when you look mm -hmm. back at their history, he's sort of right. So can you talk about the history of human rights and the People's Republic of China? Absolutely. So the People's Republic of China, unfortunately, has a very questionable uh, history with human rights. Uh, we can think of uh, Mao during the 20th century, under whose rule over 30 million people were killed. I mean, you wanna talk about a genocide, that's a very large one. Um, and this combination of nationalism and statism um, is really tipping towards uh, totalitarianism um, in the People's Republic of China. You know, there's all this talk about how well, you know, the Chinese have incorporated maybe some more liberal or capitalist elements in the past decades. And while in some small areas that's true, that's really mostly crony capitalism. And um, many of those elements are actually being crushed at this point anyway. And so this has been an ongoing problem um, for China uh, with their human rights issues. And if we don't address it, it will continue to be a problem. Yeah, I mean, there seemed to be a moment of hope. You know, Nixon goes to China, it starts to open up. You you start to see more capitalistic uh, mindset there. You see the rise of like, uh, is it Alibaba or a Jack Ma's company? And, you, you know, you hear about, you know, these billionaires in China who have these big companies and they start to invest in America. And then it just seems like in the last five years, it's fallen apart. And Hong Kong has kind of been the centerpiece of that. So can you talk about what's happening in Hong Kong specifically over the last decade? Absolutely. So Hong Kong really was supposed to be and used to be kind of this um, center of freedom in China. It was really the only pr place in mainland China that had any sort of um, freedom of expression, of movement, of, of anything. And unfortunately, uh, the PRC has been increasingly cracking down on that. And so dissent is punished. Um, people do not have the same freedoms that they do. And just within the last year, really the last elements of freedom that people in Hong Kong had 
are starting to slip away. So it's really no surprise that people in Hong Kong are actually increasingly trying to leave, go to Great Britain or elsewhere throughout the world. Yes, and then, then we start to hear about the Uyghurs. Who are the Uyghurs and what is happening to them? So the Uyghurs are a primarily Muslim minority group um, with a large population in China. And they have faced um, oppression from the Chinese government for a long time. But since around 2017, that has become really, really strict. There was a, a supposed natural, natu national security law passed that resulted in this mass surveillance of the Uyghur people. Anywhere they go, they are tracked, they are watched, they are categorized. Um, and about 800,000 to 2 million Uyghurs um, are currently in what the Chinese call re-education camps, but are closer to internment camps or concentration camps. Um, the BBC has done some great reporting on this, which is why the Chinese government is now banned to them from um, mainland China. Uh, but on, on um, more devastating notes, there's so much reporting that has come out in previous months about um, people within those camps and Uyghurs being forced to do hard labor, forced to pick cotton, which has such a terrible connotation um, throughout history. Um, women supposedly being forcibly sterilized, um, assaulted, and uh, children in those camps being brainwashed. There really is an active effort to destroy the culture of this group of people. Yeah, and they seem to be cracking down on not just this group, but all religions. Mm -hmm. I know something like two million yes. churches have been eradicated. I mean, if you read the Christian press and some of what's happening to the Christian religion there, it, it is certainly not as extreme or as awful and oppressive mm -hmm. as it is with the Uyghurs, but certainly they seem to be cracking down. And, and then you have the vanishing of businessmen like Jack Ma just disappeared. And mm -hmm. clearly he's been reabsorbed uh, into their government. I mean, when, when you look back at, you know, you're a historian. So when you look at the actions of the PRC and compare it to Stalin or Hitler, you know, specifically with with the German Holocaust. We, mm -hmm. I think, culturally, it um, and maybe you can give some shade to this. Why we always seem to go back to Hitler's Germany, you know, I think it's because it's the most culturally available. Like, you know, my mm -hmm. family's German, uh, and I think we have a better understanding of it. But first, why do we why do we typically compare situations like this to that? specific period of time? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I wish I had a good answer for you because I ask myself that question all the time. There are so many other things that you can compare contemporary events to. I mean, I think it goes to, you I mean, you're familiar with Godwin's Law. The longer that an argument goes on on the internet, the more likely <laughs> someone's going to mention Hitler or the Nazis or the Holocaust. Um, I think it's just because like you were saying, it's so huge in our historical memory and the World War II especially is so enormous in, um, in American historical memory that first off, that's really only one of the few things that most people really know about history. And so it's easy to kind of pull out of the ether, but also because it was just, when you talk about the Holocaust, we talk about Hitler and what the Nazis did, it was so almost undescribably egregious that it's, it's the most negative, insulting critical thing that you can say about a political opponent and you know we look at today's modern political discourse people are always looking for something to um label their political opponents as you know really really bad yeah it's like a jump to the to the worst thing so exactly. you know i don't know if, if comparing the uyghur situation to the holocaust it is is that dismissive of what happened almost 100 years ago? Or are there parallels here? Or, you know, I don't think people mean to be offensive or, or diminish, but they're looking for the right language. I mean, help us compare and contrast if we should even do that. Yeah, so that's, that's I'm glad you asked that question, because one of the issues um, that I think most people have when we talk about historical comparisons and analogies is that we go too big. You know, I've gotten questions a lot in my field of what was worse, the Holocaust or slavery in the United States? I just don't even answer that question, um, in part because you can't. Those are two huge events, um, and it's, it's very complicated. And so what historians try to do is they look at trends, they look at individual smaller events that can be compared. For example, one thing that comes up in Holocaust studies a lot is 
comparing the language of the Nuremberg laws to Jim Crow laws in the United States. And mm -hmm. actually uh, German officials during the Holocaust did actually take from the Jim Crow laws in the United States. And so wow. those are comparisons that are much lower level and much more, um, to be honest, accurate and much more um, you know, relevant to the, some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, it's tendencies. Oppression has yes. tendencies. Yes. Uh, so, so when we look at some of those oppressive tendencies that regimes have, I mean, what, what do you see in the PRC's behavior towards the Uyghurs that sticks out to you? Absolutely. So it's, it's a couple of different things, and I'll expand it a little bit to what's happening in Hong Kong and broader China. You know, one of the first things you see in, in totalitarian regimes, um, like the ones we saw in the 20th century, is uh, cracking down on dissent. So during the Holocaust, the first prisoners of concentration camps um, were actually just political prisoners, were people who disagreed with the Nazis. And so you're seeing that happen, happen in Hong Kong with dissent being punished. You know, what you mentioned about um, some of the Christian churches um, being oppressed as well, of course, the Uyghurs, and that's where it starts. The problem is with these huge totalitarian um, regimes, the value of human life goes down more and more and more. And that's one of the many reasons that they often unfortunately lead to mass killing, lead to genocide. And that's what we're seeing with the Uyghurs here, just like we saw in the Soviet Union um, with the star forced starvation in Ukraine, like we see with the Holocaust. Obviously we're not talking about the same degree here at this point, but you see some similarities of um, forcing people into camps of uh, forcible brainwashing, trying to erase the culture of a specific group of people. There are definitely a lot of red flags that are appearing to anyone who knows anything about 20th century history. So how do we deal with it? I mean, do we not purchase goods from China? Do we encourage our representatives to, you know, be punitive in some way or cut deals, you know, with other avenues? I mean, uh, what are, obviously, you're coming from the perspective of immigration. I mean, what are some ways that the average American can make their voice heard on this issue? Absolutely. So that's that's really challenging. I'll say first that there are some organizations that do a really good job about this, um, humanitarian organizations. Um, but, you know, so we look at the 20th century, and there were quite a lot of boycotts of German goods in the United States. And while that was quite effective at the time, it's gonna be much more difficult for us to boycott all Chinese goods, because let's be honest, I look around my office here, a lot of things that I'm using right now probably have some connection to China. And so as much as I would like to do that, it would be very difficult to do considering how entwined our economy is. Not that it's not worth trying, but it would be extremely difficult. Um, you know, I think as cliche as this says, I mean, or as this sounds, yeah, you mentioned having our voices be heard. I think that's actually a huge part of it. If you look back in history, um, the role of petitions, the role of protests, the role of um, mass demonstrations is an enormous factor in pushing back against um, things like this. You know, back in uh, the 1940s, there was a huge multi-day rally in uh, Madison Square Gardens against what the Nazis were doing. Um, to the Jews. Eleanor Roosevelt was invited. It was this huge event. Um, and a lot of that pressure actually led the government to taking action, eventually developing their own refugee program. And so I do believe that there is room for that. There is room for individuals to gather together in groups and push back on this. But I will say it's also not an easy task. There is, you know, as I mentioned in the article, as you alluded to, there's an immigration component to this. And that's not something the average person can do. Um, unfortunately, that's a government policy. Um, but I think urging the government to uh, allow more refugees in, to create some sort of special visa system like the British are doing for people fleeing Hong Kong is a very good place to start. I mean, is it a matter of contacting uh, our representatives? Because this just seems like a no-brainer. I mean, if freedom is ending in a place like Hong Kong, which once was the most free place on earth, when the British transferred it to the Chinese government, I think in 1999, I, th I remember being mm -hmm. younger. Um, and now it's fully a part of the, the Chinese system. Um, I mean, do we contact our representatives? Do we, like you said, hold protests? I mean, what are, what are some ways that we can really uh, make this felt and, and start to get some action from both the administration and Congress people? 
Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, I think it's all of the above. I think um, at, at heart, there's a role in organizing. It's not just so you and I, if we're trying to do things separately, we might not have that much power. Now, yes, we could contact our representatives and we probably should. We could, you know, put signs on our houses or post on Facebook or whatever, you know, whatever people do these days to, to, to protest. But there's something very powerful about, to be honest, collective action, um, gathering with other people to protest, to have some sort of um, system of calling your representatives, to have some sort of petition writing program. Um, those, are, those are very important and um, to really rally people in power to, to do something. So, you know, I've, I've already had some conversations with a small group of, friend of my, friends of mine about what we can do, um, but that's really the first place to start because we could sit here talking for hours about what we, what we should do, what we can't do, but it's, it starts with taking that action and finding like-minded people. Well, the first step that you can take is go to The Federalist, check the show notes of this episode, and grab the article, The United States Should Give Hong Kongers and Uyghurs a Ticket to Freedom by Amy Lutz. Uh, you had a co-author on that, did you not? I, I did, don't... Aaron Tao, yeah. Aaron Tao, okay. And uh, make sure you share that on social media and just spread the word. And, and you know, if you uh, learned something in this episode, you can do the same with this. Amy Lutz, a writer for The Federalist and a historian, part of the Young Voices program. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me on. Before we go, where can people follow you? How can they follow your work? Absolutely. So to be honest, the best place is probably Twitter. I am Amy Lutz and then the number four, Amy Lutz four on Twitter. Great. And I will put that in the show notes if you want the link. Thank you so much for listening to The Chris Spangle Show. We will see you again soon. Um.